Hello, everybody. Welcome to week 26 of ENM 2020. Town won't be won't be with us today because he has something else important to do, and uh, so he asked us to take care of this uh, week of questions and answers. Today we have Hannah Owens and Mona Papish and me to try to answer your questions, and uh, we also have a list of answers in the spreadsheet we have, and Town for sure will be adding those answers in a, an extra material for uh, this week in the, uh, I guess in the web page he, uh, he does that. So we can start probably uh, looking for the questions that were more in some sense relevant for this week uh, course uh, talks and probably the ones that are more common or are repeated. Do any of you guys want to start? I'm going to share my screen with the questions in the spreadsheet. And probably what we can do is just mention the line where the question you're interested in is. Okay. Anna, do you want to start? Uh, sure. I guess we could start from the top. Um, okay. I didn't really have a, a good idea, you know, like an order for any of these. Um, yeah, so it seems like this is a more general question uh, from, I can't see who it is, but uh, so they say, I wanted to ask this a long time ago. Why have we why we have to always think E space is in two dimensions. It's very hard to add a third, fourth dimension to the graph. However, are there any other methods for seeing multidimensional? Uh, we may see potential patterns for multidimensional variable scale. Am I right? Um, yeah, so I, the reason we often talk about E space being in two dimensions is just because it's easy to show on a piece of paper. So, and usually, and the reason that we generally use temperature and precipitation is that those are variables that we have the data for. They're easy to obtain. Um, they're easy to show. Uh, and I think, you know, whoever started probably just started with temperature and precipitation and everyone else is like, yeah, fine, that works. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but, um, uh, but yes, but E space is better thought of as an n dimensional hypervolume, right? So with one dimension for every environmental variable that you choose to add to the model. Um, but of course that gets complicated. So if you have seven or 10 or 20 variables, um, you can't really depict that in a single visualization because we're limited by what we can see to two dimensions or maybe three if you can actually, you know, if you have the plot that's like, you know, you can show the Z axis, but it's going to be flattened. So it's not as easy to see, or, you know, you can have it in on a VR screen where you can manipulate it, or you can have it as a animation or something like that. But that's really kind of the limitations that we have. And so one thing that you can do is um, kind of, as you mentioned, uh, scaling things in multi, uh, scaling things using multivariate uh, statistics. So most commonly uh, principal components analysis, but you can use other multivariate ordination methods as well that can even force things to be in two dimensions or three dimensions, although you will lose some, some information by doing that. Um, but then you can start to see a little better um, the patterns that are being formed in that multidimensional space uh, and visualize them better in two or three dimensions. Does anybody have anything else to add on that? Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. Uh, it's difficult to see a pattern in three, in three dimensions. You have to actually rotate the figure to see all the context. And yep. two dimensions, it, it, it may be, it, you may think it's simple, but it actually uh, gives you a lot of information, especially if you try different combinations of variables. And that, that's actually what yep. I do. It's not just about the precipitation and temperature. It, it, it's about the variables that are relevant for your study. And then you can explore them all 
in different combinations, and that's actually very useful. It allows you to see how environmental conditions are in your region. Um, and 3D figures are nice, are cool. <laughs> They're not <laughs> too useful in when you print them in a paper, though. Uh, and about like principal components and things like that, yeah, they're they're usable for summarizing information, but they are more difficult for interpretations. Yep. Um, let's go to another question then. Uh, I have here highlighted some questions. I think, uh, Hannah, you did that, right? If you mm -hmm. want to pick one of those, since you were one of the speakers this time, it's okay. What we do is usually concentrate on people that were the speakers, and then mm -hmm. we can either add some uh, inf uh, criteria or, 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 or answers or yeah. pick a question. Yeah, that's that works. And um, yeah, I guess we should also note that Catherine Yates couldn't make it uh, to the question and answer session, but she did supply some information that we can share with you all during the exactly Good. during the thing. But we can try to help elaborate on that. Um, yeah, okay. So we have one here from Anai who says, "Hello, thank you so much for the interesting lectures this week. I was wondering if it would be possible to somehow combine suitab suitability information from niche models at different time periods for a single species." and use that information to get a better transferability into future conditions. By using these different models at different times and thus different environments, uh, could that help reduce the amount of non-analog environments due to the future conditions? Um, yeah, I mean, there are people that have done these sorts of time-structured niche models in the past, um, but it does depend a lot on the nature of both the environmental data you have as well as the occurrence data you have. So you wanna make sure that that environmental data matches the time periods that you're talking about. So if you want to model, or if you want to make models for periods of every 10 years, say, um, you want to make sure that the environmental data you're using follows those periods as well as the occurrence data. Um, yeah. Uh, also, you can do it uh, in a single year, but that requires even more finely partitioned time data. So uh, the citation that is shown here, but slightly cut off, but the important part is that the author is Franz and the year is 2018. Um, they actually did what they call a multi-state model where they um, modeled different uh, periods of the breeding season for um, some sort of large pinniped. I don't remember if it's, I don't remember. It, some big marine mammal in New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> it escapes me which one. Um, but they wanted to look at uh, the displaying cycle and the breeding cycle, and they built niche models for each one of those and then stuck them all together with the idea that for those different behavioral cycles, um, there was actually different environmental conditions that were more important at those particular times. And then they were able to combine that all together. Um, and yeah, you might get a better, more detailed picture of the niche of the species. Um, I'm not sure it would actually help you as far as reducing the amount of non-analog environments under future conditions. It's more just helping to uh, reduce some of the error we might get if it's if we're talking about a broad time period that we're doing a climatology for. And there may have been, you know, there may have been a few odd years where the temperature was much higher or lower, and the species may or may not have been present in a particular place at a particular time. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts from folks on that? Well, yeah. Uh, I think it depends also in the algorithm. Algorithms that mm -hmm. use only occurrence data for for calibrating a model for creating a, a shape of your ecological niche they will be in some sense easier to do with different with data from different time periods uh, but of course you don't have the background or 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 other data from the area of interest that uh, can contribute to calibrate your model in that sense uh, and also uh, 
it doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, reducing the risk of finding non-analogous conditions. Uh, but it's interesting. The question, I guess, I think Anais works with, uh, it's a paleontology, so a paleontology, mm -hmm. so okay. she works with very different time periods. And that could be very interesting. The problem to me is that when you create these kind of models and you have a area that is your M, your area of calibration, uh, different time periods may have different problems regarding sampling. So they, the sampling is mm -hmm. not complete. And you're artificially saying some places are more suitable during that period because of the sampling rather than the, because of the actual suitability for the species. So it's, it's hard, it's complicated. Uh, I also cannot see uh, 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 like a direct way to reduce extrapolation risks other than like combining all the information in the calibration region for the different periods and then compare that to another scenario to which you want to transfer the model. But again, that has a lot of assumptions as well. So I think it can be explored, but it needs to be carefully done. That's, that's what I think. Yeah, do you want to talk about that, uh, the question above that that you highlighted, the relatively constant variables question? Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question and I, it has happened to me, that's why I highlighted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was using soil data and trying to use that again, the same variable in the future. In like, if you're thinking very like, close future years, it's okay because soil don't don't change doesn't change that much uh, in in that amount of in that period of time. But uh, it has some implications, and the answer that is given here it it's very important because if it if that's really a a very important variable for the species, perhaps you need to use it. Uh, but I don't agree in that like variables like altitude should be used that way because altitude, mm -hmm. is, altitude is not a like a direct factor that species feel. Like if you close your eyes and someone takes you uh, in an helicopter to a higher place or to a lower place, you cannot feel it. You, don't, you cannot say, oh, this is uh, 20 meters higher. Or, or 100 meters lower. What you feel is probably the, the, the first thing is temperature, humidity, probably like if it's really different, like atmospheric pressure or something like that, but not altitude. And the problem with altitude, because it's a proxy of other variables people use, but the problem is that the same altitude in Mexico is not reflecting the same variable, the same values of variables that the same altitude in Ecuador. Even the same altitude in one side of the uh, mountain range in Ecuador is not reflecting the same value than the same altitude in the other side of the mountain range. So uh, to me that variable is not that good, but there, there are other variables that are really direct factors that influence the species niche. And for those, we need to think carefully about whether to include it or not. I was going to say that the question uh, in the in the context of climate change. Um, so the question is about transferring the, the niche model um, into the future. I think in this context, the use of altitude or elevation becomes it becomes even in my mind becomes even more complicated more more difficult um so when i when i do future projections of of species niches i don't include altitude or elevation uh, because we we don't do three-dimensional models of of species distributions and the 
the area <laughs> with, uh, with elevation, the, the size of the area with elevation, that relationship is, is complicated. And on top of that, you have climate change with having different, uh, with a different behavior uh, on an elevational gradient. So I just get, yeah, I, I have a mental block when it comes to using elevation in future projections. And I don't, I don't think I understand the relationship well. I'm rambling on. But basically what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that whatever understanding we have on the relationship of the relationship between elevation and climate currently it's not in my mind it's not transferable to climate along an elevational gradient in the with climate change or in the future so yeah <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't use elevation in future projections <laughs> bottom line <laughs> Uh, Mona, I, do you I want, see. Do you want to I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say that all questions are. I mean, most of the questions are are answered, and as I was fishing for one that hasn't been answered uh, in uh, writing, and I think twenty six fifty is not answered. Okay, this one. But it's a. Uh, I don't have an answer for this one. So the question is. Um, <laughs> the participant says, I have seen in my projects that the highest suitability values in the current scenario is always greater than in the future past transferred scenario. Why is this happening? Is this an observed known pattern? How should we see this when searching for stable areas? Should we normalize uh, projected values? One suspicion I have is that the, the range of environmental values varies um, across temporal you know periods so it could be that the beaming of um, let's say tem temperature in the current when you calibrate the model it could be that the beaming of the temperature into I'd say I don't know 200 beams and then for back casting, <laughs> so going into let's say place to scene or going into the future, it might be that 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 is um, what affects the model, the the suitability values. But I'm not sure. So I'll I'll let maybe Anna, you wanna talk about that because you have more experience. Yeah, well, I th I think it just it varies a lot on the model that you've made and where you're projecting it in the future. Like I don't think it's necessarily true that you're always going to see higher suitability uh, higher suitability values in the training region than in the projection region. Um, because we'll talk about this next week. Occasionally, especially with extrapolation, we can get really high suitability values for areas that are outside the training region. Um, but yeah, I think it, it depends a lot on your particular uh, scenario. And actually, uh, you probably don't want to normalize projected values, especially if you're trying to figure out, um, if you're trying to infer a distribution instead of looking at the full suitability surface, because if you normalize that projected region, it may end up that you're going to get um, a really weird looking distribution that maybe says that things are way more um, suitable than they should be. Um, and so keeping everything at the same scale, I think, is, is helpful because that is actually telling you something. So it may be that for your particular species, suitability is just going down in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and I think I, I haven't noticed this pattern because I tend not to pay attention to the um, to the um, continuous values. Mm. So when I do future projections, I work with the thresholded outputs. Um, so I haven't, yeah, I haven't, I've not paid attention to this possible pattern <laughs> of yep. uh, difference in the actual suitability value between training and projections. It, it depends a lot on how how conditions change how directional some changes are as well and it depends a lot as well on what gcm you're using 
and what RCP you're using. So uh, I have seen a listing and temperate zones. There's always the trend that uh, the future predicts gains towards the north because of temperature is increasing in that direction, in like that pattern. And then some RCP, some, some let's call it uh, uh, scenarios of greenhouse, green, greenhouse gas scenarios predict more change, like uh, more areas will be warmer in the future. And that will artificially increase in some sense, like the suitability in some areas, if you're, temperature variables are contributing a lot to your model. Uh, but uh, if you change the greenhouse gas scenario, the gain is not gonna be that notorious. If you change different GCMs, like different general circulation models, gains and losses are not going to be the same. And of course, stability is not going to be the same if you compare uh, suitable, suitable areas currently and future. So yeah, I think it depends entirely on how the conditions are changing, how big is your area, and and all of that, right? Mm -hmm. There was there was a question about extrapolation as well. Uh, oh yeah, this one, yeah. It says is transfer the same as extrapolation in models, and and, and the I think the direct answer for this <laughs> is no. But uh, I understand the confusion. So we generally talk about extrapolation when we're using an algorithm, uh, referring to the way that model does predictions outside the range of conditions in which that particular model was calibrated. Uh, so there are, I, I've been confused about this as well. I haven't, asked, I haven't found my final answer, I one that convinces me entirely, but you have at least three different terms that can be, that can lead you to this confusion. They are prediction, projection, and transfer. So generally we talk about transfer when we say uh, we're using this model to predict suitability for in these conditions here, but these conditions are similar to the ones that are present in the calibration area, even though they are either in a different time period or a different area. Then projection and prediction can vary. Projection is generally more broad in terms of not only statistics, but also other types of modeling. And prediction, it's, it's referring sometimes, like most of the time I've read it as the direct value that you obtain when you apply a model to a, a specific set of conditions. If it's multivariate, some variables, and if it's univariate, that variable in particular, but just some values. So, and extrapolation can also be referred to this problem we can have when we do model projections or transfers. Uh, because if you have your calibration region that has specific values and you project your model to different areas or time scenarios, uh, you may find non-analogous conditions in those projections, in those projection environments. And uh, we call a less strict extrapolation to predictions that are made in conditions that are uh, totally different to the ones in your calibration area. And then you have some level of extrapolation risks in areas that are at least uh, some of the variables are not analogous, are non-analogous, but few of them are analogous. And then you can have also distinct levels of similarity between the calibration area and the projection area. So it's it's a little complicated to, to explain it, but just uh, have in mind that transfer is referring more to uh, the process of projecting your model to a different set of conditions and extrapolation, the way we talked about that in these classes at least, is um, either how your model is making those projections or the risks that you have when doing those projections to non-analogous conditions. What do you think, guys? 
Yeah, I mean, you're definitely, um, I saw multiple questions about this, which is great because we've basically set up my talk next week. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so um, generally, yeah, so model transfer is making the map using the model and extrapolation is asking that model to guess what happens in an area outside the training region. Um, so we often talk about extrapolation as a source of uncertainty and a lot of times that's the major proxy that we're using when we talk about projection uncertainty. So if we have a map of extrapolation and we have areas of high extrapolation, generally we interpret that as an area that's very uncertain in the model versus an area with very low extrapolation that has conditions that are very similar to those used to train the model. We tend to be a little bit more confident in what the model is saying in those areas. Yeah. yeah, and it, it's it's complicated. It's not easy because depending on how the responses in your region, in your calibration region are, some extrapolations can be safe all the time, even if they are non analogous yeah. conditions, because your response curves just started to decrease before reaching the border of conditions in your calibration area. So all conditions, basically, I'm not saying this is the right answer for finding your mm -hmm. fundamental niche, but basically those extrapolations done outside of your calibration area in terms of environmental conditions are safe, even though the areas are very non-analogous or very different compared to the calibration area. So it's, it's important and you're gonna see that next week as well. So it's very nice <laughs> doing that, that talk. Yeah, yeah, I think Catherine really set me up well, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And any other question? I was, uh, uh, I saw two questions that are similar. So two, and we are not, the answer will be very short on this. So <laughs> two, six, six, one. Oh gosh, I don't have. This one? Yes, yes. So, so 2661 talks about sample size. Uh, what is the, um, the sample size, uh, acceptable sample size in ENM for transferability? And then 2674 yeah. <laughs> um, says, what is the sample size, basically? What's the, and I like that, I mean, <laughs> we keep in various aspects of ecological niche modeling, discussing various aspects of ecological niche modeling, this question keeps, keeps uh, surfacing. And I, I you know, saw it twice, maybe, the, maybe there are more than two um, iterations of, of this question, the sample size, but yeah, they, they've been answered. There are no rules. <laughs> um, I guess 2661, um, the question is a bit more um, elaborate, <laughs> so. But there is an answer for it already, so I don't know if we need to. Yeah, well, I mean, like, that. yeah, if if you want to go down to, like, the very basics, you need to have at least as many points as you have explanatory variables. But that's not going to be, that's not going to get you very far. Like, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, so, yeah. I, 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 I am uh, more demanding. <laughs> right. <laughs> when I, I mean, I'm saying I like if we have to start students. somewhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I get very um, anxious when a student comes with an idea of a project and the, the sample size is smaller than the number of variables or equal or they're about like, ah. <laughs> let's remove some of these variables because <laughs> you cannot do that but yeah I mean it's I think every time we bring up this this this, this topic of sample size um, sometimes sometimes maybe the answers are a bit you know, annoyed or annoying or <laughs> or tongue in cheek or making fun, but it is it is there's no yeah boilerplate solution because each each 
study each modeling experiment is is unique is different the questions that you the question that the person is trying to answer with that particular model affects the uh, decision of you know sample size so on so forth so i don't yeah i don't think we need well, to go into the details <laughs> but yeah but at least like as far as explaining why there's so much variation it depends a lot on the explanatory variables that you're using it depends on the size of the training region so if you have a very small training region with a very low resolution maybe you only have four cells in your training region <laughs> if you have two points that's pretty good sampling but i mean it's to make it like a really small, simple yeah. example, right? But, you know, yeah. so yeah, the size of your training region and the resolution make a big difference, but also the heterogeneity of the training region. Mm -hmm. So if all, if one variable just doesn't change throughout the whole range, all you need is one point. Mm -hmm. But if you have a really heterogeneous environment, you're going to need much more points in order to really get the full feel for mm -hmm. what's going on in a region. Yeah, yeah and, and to... Sorry, Marlon, I'm going yeah. on and on. I was going to say um, this heterogeneity point. Um, we can we can explore that point relatively easy nowadays. There is uh, niche A. There is um, SDM toolbox for ArcGIS users. So SDM toolbox has a um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name. The the I guess it's heterogeneity. Uh, the name of the tool, but it allows you, it creates a, a PCA um, space of your environmental variables and then it beans the, the, your pixels into heterogeneity classes. So you could, and you know, I've experimented with that, you, you can figure out how, you can estimate how heterogeneous your um, presence data are. Um, and that also helps with deciding, you know, how you split your presence data into training and testing, if you don't have, you know, which is a lot of, most of the times so we don't have independent test data. So what we do is we take the sample the presence data we have and we separate those into two subsets of uh, training and testing. So that's where, you know, heterogene heterogeneity is also important. But yeah, I think it's, the question, the resolution of your data, heterogeneity, the size of the uh, of the um, study area. So it's not that we don't have. It's not like like we threw we threw our hands in the air. Like, That's it. We can. There's yeah. nothing we can do about sample size. We're just gonna blindly run models. Well, we are. I think the <laughs> the slight discomfort or the <laughs> uh, annoyance comes when 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 students want a simple answer, like is 20 sample, 20 occurrences enough? Like, I don't know, show me your study region, what kind of variables, what's the question? Yeah. Which is to say there's no simple answer, but there are ways of figuring out whether you have a decent enough sample size. Sorry, Marlon, I, I'm done. <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> that, that, that was a very good point. And I just wanted to add that, uh, Sample size depends entirely on the quality of the data, how, how well the range of the species has been sampled, how well the environmental conditions that the species is using have been sampled. And remember, model transfers limitations do not depend only on the data, but also in the calibration region. Because even though you may have very well sampled in your calibration region, your species is, has been very uh, carefully sampled there. If your calibration area, which is a reflection of what has been accessible to the species, like in general terms, uh, doesn't have certain conditions and only reaches a level of temperature or whatever the variable is that is very close to what is more suitable for the species. You have always going to you're always going to have problems when you do projections because that indicates that the response curve of suitability is going to continue increasing till it reaches that point of maximum suitability where is the, where the limit of the variable is in your calibration region and there is no way to find or to uh, uh, figure out the, where that suitability starts to decrease. 
So if you don't know that, you're always going to find problems when you do model transfers, because if you do free extrapolation or, or normal extrapolation, that value of suitability is gonna continue increasing even if the temperature is 300 degrees. If you do clamping, <clears throat> you're gonna assume that the maximum value of suitability found at the limit of the calibration region is always going to be the same until you reach the, like, imagine the craziest value of temperature you can find. And that's not true. So, and doing no extrapolation is also not safe because it's gonna say, you reach the maximum value of suitability and then it decreases to zero when it's after 26 degrees or something like that. So there is no safe way. There are other ways like more kind of hybrid or mechanistic ways to kind of use a suitability that increases and decreases, but uh, in correlative niche model, you're always going to have those kind of problems. And it entirely depends on how, how your data looks like in environmental space, but also compared to how your region looked like in that environmental space. So that, that's why it's so important to explore the variables. Those visualizations are, are so important. Yeah. And I think that, that has a lot to do with uh, one of the questions that I don't remember where that is, but it said something like, uh, if I have a species that is endemic, I have more uh, risk of extrapolation or, or more problems doing the model transfer. Uh, it was something like that, but I, don't, I cannot find it right now. Yeah, I remember that question. Uh... And, and my, 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 I'm gonna do a fast answer and then I'm gonna let you guys talk about it. My <laughs> fast answer is uh, not necessarily because a small region could be heterogeneous enough to present suitable and non-suitable values that go uh, from very wide ranges of environmental conditions. And then there you probably, if you have a world sample species uh, range, you can have good models, even if it's endemic to a, a small region, like for so, some regions in Latin America, in South America, they have a very, uh, heterogeneous environments in very small areas. In those, I can imagine something like that. Uh, but if you are in a, a, a in a very wide region with very similar conditions everywhere, and you have endemic species there, then probably climatic variables are not going to be enough to characterize well the niche. And you're always going to have either flat responses or responses that increase to the borders and you're going to have more problems when doing transfers. Yeah, yeah, so I found the question, it's line 2657. Uh, it says, could it, it could be possible that an endemic species limited by climate has a realized niche close to its fundamental, bleh, close to its fundamental niche, and for instance, be good candidates for niche model and niche model transfer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's possible that you can have a species with a fairly limited range that is limited, that seems to be limited only by climate, um, but can access all of the suitable habitat and isn't limited biotically. Um, but model transfer is always going to be complicated by non-analog environments. Like even if you've done a phenomenal job and have the fundamental niche exactly right, um, your niche model could still uh, have to extrapolate in those non-analog environments. And yeah, it's true that in most cases you would expect a an environmental variable to have that bell-shaped curve for something like temperature or precipitation. Um, but for other things, you depending on how physics works, you may actually not have that. So like I do a lot of uh, marine niche modeling in temperate and uh, almost Arctic environments. And so for me, sea ice concentration is a major um, driver for a lot of species distributions. And uh, yeah, basically once sea ice reaches 100, like you just can't swim anymore, right? Because it's all solid. So it just doesn't behave in a way that you get a bell-shaped curve um, because of the way the species is interacting with that particular variable. So um, yeah. 
I mean, yeah, you can have a great model and uh, model transfer can still be an issue. So you just have to be careful. Yeah. I wonder if this question also was alluding to the fact that when you, so it says um, uh, that the realized niche is close to its fundamental niche and mm -hmm. and such be a good candidate for ecological niche model tra and model transfer. I wonder if it had, if it was, if the uh, participant was also thinking about being able to model the potential, to estimate the potential distribution in the new mm -hmm. region or you know, the model transfer. Yeah more accurately because the fundamental and realized are close in the calibration or in the uh, yeah in the calibration area and there is there is also the if if that's the case if the question is also about am i going to have a more accurate estimate of potential distribution in this situation when i'm uh, transfer the model if that's the question then there's the added complication of you know <laughs> biotic interactions not necessarily following the same pattern in the you know, area that where the model was transferred so yeah i don't know it's a bit more complicated if it, if it is about the yeah. fundamental niche the question is about the fundamental niche maybe <laughs> with the camera <laughs> but if it's about the potential distribution estimate then i would say not necessarily <laughs> Yeah. True. Yeah, I guess sort of building on that biotic interaction thing, we did have some questions about the Eltonian noise hypothesis. Uh -huh. um, so like, yeah, 2659 says, uh, we saw the effect of Eltonian noise as an effect that can be neglected when making large scale models. I will say, I want, I want to be very clear that I don't think that you can offhand just say the Eltonian noise hypothesis is probably true, so we don't need to worry about biotic interactions. I want to be very clear about that. Um, but yeah, and so that makes this, you know, the, and then the, the question is actually in the case of vector-borne diseases, uh, the distribution of vectors would be highly influenced by the distribution of their hosts. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so there are several inst there there are a lot of instances where the Eltonian noise hypothesis does not hold up. It's true that in many cases it does, but you need to be very careful in considering the natural history of the organisms that you're modeling uh, when you are interpreting your transfers um, in geographic space. Whether that's you know in the training region or outside of the training region, it doesn't matter. You still need to be very careful to look at your model and make sure that it makes sense in the context of what you know about uh, the biotic interactions of the species. So yeah, for vector-borne diseases, vector-borne diseases are a perfect example where if you don't have the host, you're not going to have the disease. Um, but it could even be something more simple like uh, having a forest obligate species that has suitable abiotic conditions all the live long day, but there just isn't any forest, so they can't possibly be there. So I've run into that situation uh, where I had what looked like a perfectly reasonable model uh, until, but it was a forest obligate butterfly, and the places that it was projected to be were areas where there hasn't been any forest, not because of climate, but because of deforestation. Um, so you do have to be very careful about uh, just saying, well, the Eltonian noise hypothesis is probably true, so we're fine. Um, yeah, you need to be really careful about the, the natural history of your critters or non-critter organisms. Yeah. That, that consideration is especially true when you are interested in the distribution rather than only like characterizing set of conditions that are useful. Like yeah, exactly. It will be. And it's important, as, as Hannah said, it's important when you're like uh, dealing with conservation related questions, uh, those kind of processes, they even have to be done post modeling, like mm -hmm. reshaping your result to something that is more accurate in terms of uh, presence of certain condition or like the forest, for instance, uh, that you need to have yeah. for the species to be 